Welcome, y'all. We are back. This is Conversations, the live, or it used to be live, uh, show slash podcast from Complex Creative. And I'm Tobias Rose, the principal and creative director. Uh, as you know, we do this on a, we used to do this on a semi-annual slash semi-weekly slash semi uh, hourly schedule, meaning we had no set schedule for when we released these things. But <laughs> with all that being said, we're back. This is season two. And here in season two, I guess if I could have a thesis like last year, it would be the new economy. And so we've been through a lot. 2020 happened. Uh, 2021 is happening. And so, you know, this is the chance and this is the opportunity to talk to, in my opinion, some of the influencers, some of the change makers and how they're doing it. And so, without further ado, I want to introduce my friend, Michael Schoenfeld. Mike, and usually people would clap and all that, but we don't, <laughs> we don't have all that this time. So, <laughs> so Michael, I, I don't want to mess up your title because I, I say it differently each time. You are the, direct, you are the vice president for, I, I was getting ready to throw global in there, for public policy and government affairs at Close. Duke. Okay, close. I was close. Close. Vice president for public affairs and government relations and the chief communications officer. I was going to say a real bad cuss word because that yeah. is incredibly dope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so with your job, can you explain a little bit about what you do for Duke? I yeah. am the chief external affairs officer. What does that mean? It means I oversee all of the communications, mm -hmm. uh, public relations, all of the lobbying, all of the external relations for Duke. Okay. I, if it says Duke on it, regardless of where it is, anywhere in the world, I am responsible for it. Wow. I'm the person to whom... The president, the board of trustees, the students, the faculty, the alumni, mm -hmm. the, you know, the community, the policymakers, the media. I'm the one to whom they turn and say, Mike, what's going on at Duke? Mm -hmm. So it's an awesome responsibility. Um, it is as much fun as uh, I can imagine any job being uh, because I have a license to be involved in everything that Duke does. Yes. And, you know, as you know, Duke does a lot of different things. So, yeah. so it's fun. Yeah. So... With all that, that also means that not only you said global, so that doesn't just mean the campus across town at Duke. No, yeah. You know, so Duke, Duke. I mean, it's very easy to think about Duke as the kind of place down the road. Mm -hmm. There's a nice chapel. There's a basketball arena. There's a, you know, football stadium. There's a hospital. Uh, most of our activity is there, but we have forty, about forty-five thousand employees, and they're around the world. So we have the campus in Durham. Uh, we have 9,000 acres. Wow. We, we have you a... Got, wait, 9,000? 9,000 acres, yeah. Most that's, of it is forest. If you go, in, if okay, you go into the deep forest, yeah. 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 It's, uh, that, so that's Duke. We have uh, 7,000 undergraduate students. We have about 9,000 graduate and professional students. We have a university in China. So about 30 miles outside of Shanghai, there is a, uni a giant campus called Duke Kunshan University. That's how you pronounce it, because I've been pronouncing it wrong this yeah, whole time. Well, I'd say, yeah, that's how you pronounce it. I but you know what? It. I'm not even sure I pronounce it correctly. <laughs> and I've been going there three times a year for the last 10 years. Oh, you're lucky. Uh, we have a medical school in Singapore. We have a research center for our Global Health Institute in Tanzania. And we have offices and uh, programs and activities in India, South Africa, Singapore, London. We have a Duke in Berlin program. We have a Duke in uh, France program. We have, uh, we just, we have things happening. So at any given time, we've got people or programs or activities, mm -hmm. probably 75 countries around the world. Okay. And then we have people from pretty much every country on earth at Duke. Students, faculty, staff, wow. visitors, researchers, scholars, others. So, so this is really a global, you know, the, yes, it, we are in Durham, North Carolina, mm -hmm. and we are of Durham, North Carolina, but this is really a global crossroads right here. So the fact that you're doing that is incredibly amazing to me. And especially- amazing to me too, yeah. <laughs> And, you know, and we were talking about this the other day. What's even more amazing is, is back when, uh, when I was in kindergarten, you were apparently a reporter. Uh, and I told you I was going to ask you about yeah, this yeah, because yeah. I thought it was an amazing story. <clears throat> and uh, I'm not going to say everything that you told me yesterday, but, but can you talk a bit about getting your start and what you're doing, like where it all came from? And, and I do want you to talk about some of that stuff we were talking about the yeah, other day. Yeah. But yeah, just tell us how, how you kind of got your start into becoming the guy that is in charge of communicating 
let's be honest, this is a global brand on some level. Yeah, oh, it's it's one of the most visible and valuable brands in the world. Um, You're right up there with Coca-Cola at this point. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be nice. Yeah. yeah, I would like that, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I, so uh, very quickly, I grew up in New York, yeah. uh, and one of the things I was always interested in was radio. Uh, but when I was a kid, I remember... Uh, vividly, my father would bring home the New York Times. I was, I don't know, eight, nine, ten years old. Uh, for, you know, he'd commute on the train, bring home the New York Times that he bought in the city. We lived right. in the, you know, way out in the suburbs. Uh, and I would sit down at my desk with a real old reel-to-reel tape recorder, believe it or not. Wow. Uh, and, like, tape, actual real, yeah, recorder, yeah. Real, real tape. And I would read the newspaper into the tape recorder pretending that I was a newscaster. Because that's, <laughs> that's what I wanted to do. I wanted, I wanted, so I... Started a radio station when I was in high school, yeah. uh, and then I came to Duke and uh, helped start WXDU. If you listen to 88.7 WXDU. I didn't know you helped start that. I was the first voice. And a lot of people were involved, but I was the first voice on the air. And if you go to the Duke Chronicle archives online, when the station went on the air in 1982, 83, you'll see a front page story. And you'll see a guy who looks really familiar. <laughs> picture. Uh, so, so that was... So I did that. That was great fun. Yeah. Uh, and then I was able to um, turn that into a, into a job. And I started work at the Voice of America in Washington, D.C., uh-huh. uh, the Global Radio and TV Network. And my first assignment there, my first job when I got in, uh, I thought I was going to be doing one thing. And they said, oh, no, 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 we need you on the sports desk. Uh, so here I was. Uh, first day is at, you know, at VOA. They kind of throw me on the sports desk. Now, this... Uh-huh. Remember, this is a global broadcaster. It goes out to 150 million people every right. day right. in 50 plus different languages. Uh, and I am doing the sports cast for the World Report. 40 million people listening, yeah. um, which was kind of cool. Uh, and uh, the sports report, though, was, and I thought, well, you know, basketball, football, yeah, but not, but the other kind of football. Like the regular sports that we all yeah, as no, Americans, like, yeah, right, yeah, that's right, what we right. do. But yeah. no, 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 this is a global audience. Yeah. So. Uh, it was football, soccer football. It was um, you know, track. It was mm, a little baseball. Baseball was popular all over the world. Right. And it was cricket. There you go. And uh, at my first sports guest, I have to uh, go on the air and talk about, you know, go kind of like your sport. You know, you're yeah, an yeah. evening sportscaster, and I'm talking about cricket. Uh, I have no, I've never seen a cricket match before. See, that's the problem. Yeah, big problem. Big problem. <laughs> uh, and I had a box score. I had a, I had a wire service company. I had a box score from the big, one of the biggest matches in cricket, recent cricket history, India-Pakistan test match. And these are five days long, and they have tea, and they have lunch. And you didn't know what you were doing. I didn't know what I was doing. I have a, I have a, I have a imagine if somebody gave you a baseball box score and okay. said, Tobias, I want you to go on the air in two hours, and I want you to I want you to describe what happened in this game, and you've never seen it before. I mean, it would sound like Michael Jack Michael not Michael. Listen to me, Magic Johnson back in like the early '90s. Y'all remember when Magic Johnson yeah. first started sportscasting? Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, well, the, the crew does. Some of the crew is a little too young, but you know what I'm talking oh, yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, I do. And he would be on there, look at him push the ball. Yeah. Up. <laughs> so yeah. I would sound just like Magic Johnson back in what '92 yeah. trying to sportscast. So I, so I said to the I said to the sports editor, I, this was before YouTube, by the way. I, I have uh, I have no idea. I've never seen a cricket match. He said, well, that's too bad. And he goes to a bookcase and pulls down a book that literally had dust on it like it blew the dust off and it was the one of these old books probably was 50 years old yeah. it was the rules to every game on earth that sucks and he said here you know study up that sucks. So i'm like going through here or look you know looking at the you know trying to figure out how to do it i've got the, i've got these numbers i had no idea if this was a high scoring pitchers uh, high scoring slugfest or yeah. a low scoring pitchers duel but somehow i kind of cobbled something together and I went on the air and I probably sounded pretty awful. There's no tape of it, fortunately, uh-huh. in, you know, in existence, but I probably sounded pretty awful. But then I did it like every day and I'm doing this. And after a little while, I actually got pretty good. Nice. Like I could I could take that score. I said, okay, I could write, have, again, having never seen mm-hmm. the game. And I went on the air very confident. This is Mike Schoenfeld, VOA Sports, you know, today in, uh, in, in world cricket, yeah. you know, uh, the St. Kitts and the Grenadines took on uh, Barbados in a you know, uh, high-scoring slugfest. Um, and uh, so I did that for, I, I was assigned there for a couple of months, and uh, and I actually got, I, I, I was, you know, pretty, I thought this was pretty cool. I, you know, that is got, so cool. And then I, then I then I left the newsroom and went into management, but I, but I have my, I did punch my cricket card. I 
got my that would that's got my got my cricket amazing. my cricketeer and and now whenever I travel even though I've I've only seen a live cricket match once yeah whenever I travel you know if you go overseas if you go to you know any uh, most countries overseas there'll always be a cricket match on TV so you go into the hotel right. you know flip the flip cricket the, and soccer yeah well, it's like yeah you know, it's like ESPN cricket yeah um, and uh, and I, so whenever I go whenever I'm overseas I'll like flip on a TV you changed a, <laughs> look for a cricket match that's yeah, cool they wear though. the bow ties and the, you know, yeah. the hat I mean it's, it's kind of cool that's cool how you know you get into something and it'll be a challenge like that and then it just becomes a part of you yeah you know now it's a part I, of you I have a like, I have a thing for whoops sorry about that I have a, <laughs> have a thing for cricket yeah and, that's cool all right, so I want to fast forward because now you're at Duke. So mm-hmm. you went to management and now you're at Duke. And you touched on the fact that this is a global brand. Mm-hmm. March 2020, mm-hmm. we it gets real. Everything gets real. And we go on a, a, a lockdown. I know here in Durham specifically, we locked everything down. Then nationwide, there's a whole lockdown. You all are Duke University and the medical system, the enterprise, the Duke enterprise. And then you have these global campuses, this global community, but there is a global pandemic. Can you talk to me about when you found out what was going on and some of the behind the scenes at Duke with you all like changing the entire way that you operate? Can you take us back to that time and what that looked like? So I can, and let me, I'm gonna rewind even further. Go ahead. Go back to December, 2019. Okay. Because uh, I was, I was actually my, my last trip to China. I usually go, go to China two or three times a year. My last trip to China was December 2019. I got back, I think, on about the 19th or so of December, 20th of December, and about four days later, we got an alert from our um, uh, from our team in China in Kunshan that there was this mystery ailment, uh, mystery flu in Wuhan. Now, why was that? Why is that even important? Uh, so it's December 19th. Wuhan, the city of Wuhan, is about 400 miles from where our campus is. It's also, we have a partnership with Wuhan University. I've been to Wuhan. Yeah. You've heard of Wuhan. I've yeah. been to Wuhan several times. Um, we had people from Wuhan at, at Duke. And we had people from Wuhan at Duke. So this got our attention. If it had been any other city in China, we probably you know, would have filed it away. But yeah. okay, something's going on in Wuhan. So you already had it on your radar back so then. So we had it on our radar, and we we convened a team, our emergency coordinator uh, and our infectious disease experts and myself and a few other people. We convened a team that's been meeting almost every day for the last 19 months. And we started tracking this. And so December turns into January, and things start, you know, if you recall, things in January of, 20, of 2020 yeah. were getting pretty intense in China and elsewhere. We have a university in China. We have hundreds of students and and staff so we started but the process that you saw in march of 2020 here we actually started in january and february in china so we went through all of this this whole drill evacuating people um getting you know looking how how do you do testing um uh from a university standpoint how do you uh transition from uh, a a classroom to online we went through this entire. If you go back and look at it's, it's easy to forget now. But if you go back and look at the, you know, look at the news reports, mm-hmm. we were doing all this in January and February. Um, so we get through, you know, we get through our the China phase of it, and then in March, you know, things start getting real here. You recall uh, this was also around the time of the ACC tournament. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. one of the one one of the that that week that that first week or second week I guess of March. Where uh, Rudy Gobert tests positive in the uh, in the NBA, uh, we have got the uh, we've got the ACC tournament going on, mm-hmm. and, and you, you may recall, Duke was the first school to pull out of the tournament. Yeah, because I was, uh, some people were happy. So hey, yeah, I, I, I know, no, yeah. No, <laughs> hey. uh, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Yeah, you're in Durham, my friend. I didn't even know you had that on the <laughs> side of your coat. <laughs> that is crazy. I, you talk about a brand. I'm a walking I brand. I see I'm now, a, yeah. I'm a, I'm a walking brand. So we, um, we, we, were, we had a lot of deliberations with, uh, with President Price, with Coach K and, uh, and others, and we, um, we made the decision. In fact, uh, my phone has the text on it that was sent to the ACC commissioner that says that we're, said we're out. 
And that was the domino that, that sort of set everything else within college sports. Now, all of this happened really, really quickly. Yeah. Really, really quickly. Uh, and, uh, and then, you know, the rest of the world was, uh, was in it. So we did have some preparation. We had a, we had a little bit of a playbook that yeah. we could look at, but none of us have ever been through anything like this. Uh, and we had, we had first the health issues, you know, mm -hmm. that we had to, we had uh, obviously serious questions and uncertainty about what health was going to look like. Uh, we have a healthcare enterprise, so we have you know twenty five thousand people who work for Duke Health, and we're you know we're the principal healthcare provider for you know certainly for Durham and uh, and for the region. So we had people coming from all over the country, all over the world. Um, uh, we have experts that that are uh, that that were looking at this. We have vaccine researchers. So we have we were we were all in on this from the very beginning. And then we have a university. So we have students, you know, we have students on spring break. Are they going to come back? Are they not going to come? I mean, we're, all of this, we were making all of this up as we went along. Right. Uh, and then when, ultimately, when we made the decision that we were not going to keep the, that we could not have students come back, keep the university open, the next question is, okay, what do you do with the students? And everybody talks about moving online, moving to remote instruction, as if it was a switch that you just flipped. So think about this. In on March 11th of 2020, we had you, we had 6,000 courses that were being taught on the Duke campus, and if you were a Duke undergraduate, you could not take a single online class for credit. That's just that's just not the way the way that we operated. But you had two to weeks, change. Two weeks later, yeah, we had 6,000 classes online. Now, enormous credit goes to our. Uh, first to our faculty, I mean, mm -hmm. people who just, you know, who are dedicated to their students and to teaching, learning technology, a, you know, specialists, instructional, spe I mean, people who do incredible work, but they don't do it in a whole lot of, um, yeah. uh, they don't do it in a whole lot of, of um, uh, glory. Yeah. But then there's, there's, you know, all, there's all the things you see as you were looking at Zoom and looking at your classes, but then there was the stuff that, that you couldn't see. So one of the, one of the advantages of having this early warning in December, um, our IT folks mm -hmm. uh, were very forward-looking. They, in December and early January, they went and basically tripled the bandwidth wow. for the campus because we just we knew that something was going to happen. So that's what happened with the neighborhood when the internet got slow. Well, yeah, we sucked it all. Up. Yeah. <laughs> that's so what they, 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 they were able to triple the bandwidth yeah. for you know, for the campus. And then, you know, fast forward, when you think about, I mean, I, I sort of, uh, I, I think about this with amusement now, when you think about that first day mm -hmm. when every school and every college in the country was teaching online, we didn't, you know, was this going to break the internet? Like, yeah. literally, we didn't, you know, flip a switch on Monday morning. I can't remember what that day was, the whatever, the 18th, 25th, something like that of March. You flip a switch in the country. Every kid in school, every kid in college is suddenly learning online. Everybody is home doing their work. I mean, like, this was like a like a Y two K moment. Well, I mean, that, I can tell you just just from my perspective, just from the teaching perspective, that was scary. Yeah. Because they came to me, so I'm you know I teach at UNC, and they said, you need to change your class so it can be online. So the thing that I'm thinking about is, <clears throat> I need to change my whole curriculum. And the way that I teach the entire class for the entire semester. Yeah. And there are things that I already had planned out that needed to be taught a certain way. And that was just one class yeah. for me. So, so doing I would, this for a whole, yeah, yeah, I can only imagine. So I, 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 also, I teach a class every couple of years at mm -hmm. Duke um, on politics, policy, and media and how they intersect. It's great fun, mm -hmm. you know, bring in my friends. And, uh, and we talk about, uh, about politics, policy, and media. I was teaching that semester. Mm -hmm. So I also had to like take a class um, that was based on people sitting around a table and having conversations and doing exercises yeah. um, and then do it online. And I'll never forget, you probably had the same experience, that th that first online class was about the most morose time I could imagine. I mean, I, you know, there are 20 people in the class. Some of them are in their childhood bedrooms. Some of them are, you know, at a kitchen table. That's a lot. Some of them were se were seniors. They saw jobs evaporate, like overnight. They just saw their jobs evaporate. Some of them were people who saw their internships evaporate. Um, that was yeah, obviously intellectually, it was difficult to make that transition. 
um, but it's emotionally, traumatized. it was, you know, I, I mean, yeah. I had been, a lot of us, you know, like you, we had been kind of running on fumes for yeah. months by that point. And this was just, you know, we were all in react mode, but actually, you know, sitting in my living room, looking at 20 people on a screen who's, who were so uncertain about their, not just their health, but their futures and everything else, um, that, that kind of hit, like, that was a pretty powerful for me. And I can only imagine what it was like for people who, you know, again, were, or even, were even more invested in it. And, yeah. uh, and, uh, so it was, you know, that, that was, a, something else. that was, I mean, we, we've been, go, you know, we've, and then, you know, really from March through the summer and into the year, we had a dozen decisions that we had to make every day. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I was joking, I, we would joke that for many, many months, something that seemed inconceivable at breakfast. We're gonna go, you know, somebody said at breakfast on whatever that day was, we're gonna, we're gonna close the university and go online. That'd yeah. be inconceivable. By lunch, it was, okay, let's figure out how to plan this. And by dinner, it was reality. And that happened every single day for months. Do yeah. you think dealing with the Wuhan, because you, you all were dealing with that in, I guess, what, January, December, yep. 2019? Do you think that that prepared you at all? It, it did. It did prepare us. Okay. It was very. I. I yeah. You know, it. It didn't. It wasn't a template. And you know, look, a lot of things. You know, we're, we're still. I mean, even today. Right. You know, we're we're pivoting and making changes because this thing is not over by any stretch of the imagination. But yes, it did. It did prepare us. It prepared us intellectually for the idea. You know. So and and it prepared us kind of mentally and operationally because we we had we had to do we we did things that ultimately we had to do on a much larger scale and in, obviously in different ways but yeah I, you know I, I most most vast majority of places almost everybody didn't have that level of preparation yeah so uh, I know a lot of friends of mine in the corporate in, in corporations didn't have that level of preparation uh, NGOs universities and elsewhere so we were able to give some guidance. We were able to give guidance to people um, and to institutions that that were again confronting all of this like a you know like a tsunami yeah. in uh, in March of twenty twenty. Can you tell me a bit about the vibe, the 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 emotional state of everyone? You know, because I don't think people think too much yeah. about, especially people in your position, like a vice president or even. You know, like Dr. Price and no, the board we, of trustees. We, it's a great question, yeah. and it's something that we that we thought about and ha and 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 managed for, managed through and managed for for a long time. It's very it's probably the most important thing. Yeah. So think yeah. You know, as we think back on it, and we don't have to th really think back on it. We this was th this was this unbelievably disruptive moment, not just for Durham or for Duke, but for human history, yeah. and everybody, regardless of how how much you think you're prepared, everybody was in grief. They were in shock. They were angry. They were upset. Yeah. They were scared. I mean, all of these, you know, all of these things coming together, and this is happening in the midst of you know an intensely divisive political moment in our country, an intensely divisive cultural moment. Uh, in our country, uh, and I, I will I will say that you know for those of us in and it's not just you know me and it's not just people at Duke it's you as a as a leader anybody in a leadership position if you didn't if you didn't sort of wake up and say holy cow you know this is yeah. there are a lot of people and a lot of uh, you know looking to us for leadership yep. you know one I mean small examples but <clears throat> universities as you know because you've you've worked you know you you work with many. Are very independent places. You know, you don't you don't tell a faculty member what to do. You don't tell. You know, people are just they're very they prize their independence yeah. and they prize their autonomy, and that's what that's why universities have been around for a thousand years, um, in pretty much the same form, and they work pretty darn well. Yeah. Um, but they prize their autonomy and independence. For the first time ever, we had people who w normally we would say, well, you know, you you. Here are your options. Here are the things you can do. They just said to us, "Just tell us what to do. Just tell us what. Yeah, you know, we're, you know, 
we're scared, we're uncertain, we don't have any information, we don't know what to do, just tell us what to do. How so, did that feel being responsible for that, for, um, for people who are normally so independent? Uh, yeah, it was, um, it, it was a, as, as one of my colleagues just described, it was a gestalt shift. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it okay. was it was a you know experience that this is like okay you know we we actually I will tell you we didn't have time to deliberate it yeah we just we just had to do it we just had to do it and um, and we did it uh, because we you know we had people's livelihood I mean yeah. you know think about the fi- you know economically we didn't know if this was the start of the of the next Great Depression um, so the economic dislocation the financial dislocation and we established. You know, fortunately, we established some priorities early on, um, you know, that we were going to protect jobs, that we were going to protect, that we were going to do whatever we could to protect our community yeah. um, and to pivot and to, to do that from a health standpoint, from a safety standpoint, from a community standpoint, from an economic standpoint. So it was, um, again, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, create heroes or, or be more valoric than, than, um, uh, than I deserve, but it was a pretty awesome responsibility. Yeah. Uh, you know, people were looking, you know, patients were looking to us, yeah. the community, our families were looking to us, our friends. Uh, and we had to, you know, we had, we, it was a leadership moment. And I'm just, I couldn't be, and, I, and I'll put on my, you know, my PR hat, I could not be more proud of the colleagues, you know, of my colleagues at Duke. Oh, they're amazing. Yeah. We just, we, everybody just, we just did what we had to do. And you know, from a, from President Price, uh, you know, to the to our leadership team, we we did what we had to do, and you know, it worked. That was amazing. So we, a lot of us, a lot of people thought that the pandemic was over back in May of this year. Remember, remember uh, yeah. the the vaccines came. It's like, oh, vac- the, the, the pandemic is over. The pandemic is canceled. July fourth, we're gonna have a party. Mm-hmm. It's going down. Personally. When, when that happened with with us, I remember being really cautious. In fact, I was so cautious. Um, there were some get back to work campaigns yeah. that I remember Samantha brought to me. And I said, I don't feel comfortable putting that kind of stuff out there in the world yet. And the reason was, you know, you still have people getting sick. And then we were hearing about this Delta variant back then. So it just wasn't certain. So for you all as a university and, and, and everything else that you are, what did that look like? Like taking today out of the equation now, apparently a lot of us are a lot more cautious. But what was the the general consensus in terms of what we should do uh, when you were in May, and and how did you get faked out if you did? Yeah, well, I think you know I think we all got faked out a little bit. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's hard. I remember when I when I the, just the emotion when I got my first shot, just that emotional yeah. wave that just it's like holy cow, this it's is over. it's you know this. Yeah, it's over. Yeah. This is, you know, this is a moment. But I think pretty quickly, and you know, again, we, we have an academic medical center. We have some of the top people in the world. People were saying not, you know, not so fast. Mm-hmm. Um, and vaccine, I, I can't say it enough or more strenuously, you know, vaccines, the, 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 the fight over vaccines and masking, yeah. to me personally, is sheer insanity. I've been watching some of these I've been watching the, you know, the riots at school, and I realize this is a deeply divisive issue, and I and I respect that. Isn't it weird though? But I, you know, I'm sorry. I know some, you some, can't say it so much. But some some of these things look like, you know, like like um, uh, outtakes from The Living Dead. I, yeah. I don't, I don't get it. Or Hogan's Heroes, or, or yeah. Living Color, or Saturday Night Live, because it's just like there is no way that this makes sense that you would fight someone on your health. Well, that you'd fight somebody about a, 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 mask. a piece of cloth, yeah. a piece of cloth and, and, a, and a va- you know, the vaccines. So we so we made the you know, we, we made the decision early on to be we were one of the first one of the first 10 or 15 universities to say, and this is this goes back to June, maybe mm-hmm. um, that you will have to be vaccinated to come to school, too. And we got a little you know, we got a little bit of pushback from people yeah. who would say, you know, personal choice. And I. My response to that is, yep, yeah, you know, ultimately it is your personal choice. It's also your personal choice about whether you attend Duke. Yeah. So if Point. you want to choose to not get vaccinated, that's your choice. You can, you're also make at that time, you're also making a choice not to come to Duke. Great point. And 
Uh, so, so I, I think we, you know, we, we put in place, we knew for the, for this coming year, we were going to still have to have a very vigorous testing process and all of that. Um, I think we've all been a bit, um, surprised, um, by how quickly and how pervasively the, you know, the Delta, ha the Delta variant and whatever follows it yeah. will still, um, uh, will affect our lives. Now, very big difference between testing positive as a fully vaccinated individual in August of 2021 mm -hmm. and testing positive as an unvaccinated person in August of 2020. No doubt about it. But to anybody who says, you know, this is, yeah. it's, 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 it's not over and it's only being dragged out by, you know, the incredible divisiveness and the political divide. It's, you know, we could have a long conversation. We've had we, we, conversations we, we about that kind yeah. of stuff. Now, Let's fast forward to our hopeful future. Indeed. Post-pandemic. Uh -huh. um, I want to fast forward because I remember when 9-11 happened. You know, I was in school and I remember how quiet the campus was. Now, today in 2021, we're still feeling the effects of that from the way that security works in the airport to what you can and can't take on the plane. Mm -hmm. How do you think this is going to change the way that you do business in the future? And I know you can't speculate a whole lot, but just from what you all have learned through then to now, how do you think it's going to be different uh, running a campus? Yeah, great, um, great question. So I think I think we still don't know yeah. some of that. Um, I think we still don't know um, how ultimately it's going to affect the way that we, you know, the way that we gather for meals or, you know, living arrangements. I think all of those things are, it's easy, it's easy to speculate now. Um, and, you know, and I, I'm glad I'm not in the business of like building housing or building restaurants or, you know, although we are, um, uh, at, right at this very moment, because I think there's a lot of, there's a lot more uncertainty than there is certainty. Um, you know, sure, sure. It, it, there'll absolutely be changes in, in the way that our workplace, you know, works. Um, the idea that we could go from, you know, nobody knowing what a video conference was or, or basically a, a hybrid meeting, if you, you know, yeah. 18 months ago was, you know, you putting your cell phone on the middle of that coffee table and dialing in and saying, yeah, hey, can you hear that. me? Can you yeah. hear me? Yeah. So now we've, we have sort of internalized how to. Um, how to connect with each other in different forms. Um, so I think that's important. I think from an education standpoint, um, it, you know, education has, for, for a thousand years, people have, experts have said, this is going to permanently change education. So what was the first thing that was going to permanently change education? The printing press in the 1500s. Yeah, we got books. We yeah, don't need, yeah, we, we, we're done. Yeah. Yeah, we don't need... Uh, we don't we don't need um, uh, classes anymore. To, you know, so we got books. Okay, mm -hmm. that clearly did not. Um, yeah, they didn't no. take. Uh, you go back to the you know to the beginning of the 20th century, radio. Mm -hmm. okay. It's going to change the you know it's going to change school. We're all going to listen to listen to the radio and goes well, that didn't quite work. Mm -hmm. TV, motion pictures, um, <clears throat> and then even you know, ten years ago. Um, all of our experts and policymakers are saying, that's it, MOOCs. Remember what a MOOC is? Nobody even knows what a MOOC is. No, what's a MOOC? It, uh, it's a, at the time, it was a massively on, massively open online course. It's basically online learning. It's going to change higher education. We're all done. We're all going to go to the University of Phoenix. Wow. We're all going to take our classes on video. You could, you know. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Guess what? It did, yeah. I didn't know there was a name for that. Yeah, go 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 do a wow. go do a search on the Googles and you'll find out. That, I didn't you know, know that. that. Okay, that, okay. That, that, ten years ago, that's that was going to revolutionize education. So um, clearly, this you know the the, the um, use of uh, technology, you know, the use of I hate to say the use of technology. It I mean, it's, like, it's audio, I mean, it's just what it is. Telecommunicate this new telecommunication yeah, our ability, habit. Our we, ability to interact with people um, and with each other and to learn information and to yeah. learn things and to experience things. That this turbocharged the the use of that. It's not. I mean, what I think education and place based education is mm -hmm. more important than ever. Yeah. Um, and now we have new tools, and now we have new ways of of doing it. So, so I think it. I think there'll be dramatic and sig significant changes mm -hmm. that will happen over time, and then all at once. What but, about 
the whole, you know how we say that most of what you learn in, in school, you're going to learn it outside of camp or outside of the classroom, mm -hmm. excuse me. How does that happen when the students need to stay inside? How do you yeah, facilitate but, that? Yeah, but the class, you know, the, the idea of the classroom is like, um, you know, the, the classroom is now everywhere. Like the classroom, yeah. it, you know, so we, we have now, we started this before the pandemic and it's accelerated. We, you know, many of our classes are now much more based on, you know, a, a, a professor may give a lecture that's recorded. The student watches the lecture at their, at their time. And then when you come together as a class, you're not, you're not absorbing information that somebody is talking at They've you. They've already given it to you. You are analyzing, you're assessing, you're questioning, you're testing, you're doing exercises. You're saying, okay, this is, you know, if, if this, then that. Huh. You know, you're, and you, you probably, you don't even know it, but you're doing it in your own classes as well. You know, okay. you're, you're, um, provide, you know, learning is more continuous. Yeah. Um, and it's in different forms and it comes, you know, quickly and it comes in bursts and it comes, uh, in, you know, hybrid versions. It's just, it's just a, you're, you're still learning and yeah. you're still teaching and a teacher, you still need a teacher to teach your students benefit immeasurably and in incalculable way because Tobias Rose is teaching them how to do something. But how you teach that and, and the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the way that you teach it, that's going to continue to evolve because you're evolving. Uh -huh. um, so I, I think those are going to be some of the biggest changes. Are colleges and universities going away because people are in the room? No. They're, if we've seen one thing, it is that there is a intense desire for people to be together. Not to be in their room watching something. I mean, there's some people who want to sit in their room and watch YouTube. That's fine. They've they've always been that way. They used to read comic books. Now mm -hmm. they're watching YouTube. Um, but there is an intense desire to um, come together to have what we call what the the architects call collision spaces, mm -hmm. where you just you know are meeting up and where you're able to work together. Now that collision space now is you in Durham and somebody in Singapore and somebody in Hungary and somebody in the UK and somebody in Peru. Uh, and you can replicate it pretty, you know, pretty well, but you're still going to be together. You know, I heard what you said earlier. You said, I don't want to speculate. You know, remember how thing, we thought things were going to be and it keeps changing. I heard that part, but then I also heard you throw us in game when you said the way that we learn, the way that the, the classrooms are going to be set up, go in and you know, we analyze information instead of listening to the professor give this this big long lecture. I heard that, and for me, what I took from that is maybe there's a different way that we think about education. And it sounds like y'all are kind of doing that already. We've been doing, you know, we've been doing that for years. Yeah, we've been doing that for years in a, in a lot of different ways. I mean, if you look at a classroom, uh, I mean, I think about the classroom that yeah you know, that I that when I was in a Duke classroom 40 years 40 40 years ago. Um, as a uh, I, as a freshman, um, it doesn't look anything like a classroom today, and the experience doesn't look anything yeah. like like it does today. You know, for your kids who are in, in you know, if if you were to go back and sit in that your de you know, kind of mm -hmm. your desk, um, it doesn't look anything like that. Um, I noticed that now. Yeah. Even when I went to school, you know, we didn't have laptops and things like that. But it's just crazy looking at young kids. Yeah. Like I'm talking sixth grade, seventh grade. I have to have my laptop for school. Right. Because because what they have, that yeah, you know, they have the laptop and that's sort of the, you know, that's the pad. Mm -hmm. But they have and the thing that always kind of you know blows my my mind is now right now, everything that is known mm -hmm. can be known instantly from your phone. Yep. Like can you imagine if you were in well if you were in elementary school on 9-11, you were already doing that, you know, but I, I was, I, I wasn't. I, I wasn't was. in elementary school at 9-11, oh, okay. first of all, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was, I am not that young, no. Yeah. I was a seasoned college student okay. at that right. point. Um, but, but it's still, it's interesting because that's a necessity now. That's, that wasn't a necessity 20 years ago. Well, because we didn't, like, we didn't know. Yeah. You know? I mean, we didn't, I, I, I so this is, this is how old I am. I remember... Um, let me blow the cobwebs out of, you know, out of here. 
So when I was at the Corporation for Public Broadcasting in the mid 1990s, yeah. we we funded and helped develop some something called. I mean, this this sounds like total like out of a science fiction novel. Uh, I still remember this vividly. CWise, Community Wide Education and Information Systems, and yeah, this was <laughs> what what was this was like the nonprofit public service version of AOL. I was going to say, it sounds like some 80s. Yeah. yeah it sounds like it, the 80s and, AOL. And, that, and I remember, I, I, again, I vividly remember my, the, I, I oversaw, among other things, I over, when I was at the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, I oversaw technology. Right. And the chief technologist was a guy who looked like a chief technologist at the time. He had a ponytail. I mean, he looked like he, he went to this, he went to this thing called, his name was Ted. And he was telling me, this is actually, this dates me. He was the first person to tell me about the TED conference because he would go out <laughs> like to the actual TED conference wow. in, you know, in San Francisco with other people. Uh, and I said, oh yeah, that sounds, you know, I was- You had no idea. Suit. I was yeah. like, no, that's, that's like hippie stuff. I don't yeah. know. But, you know, we got connected to the internets. <laughs> uh, and the I, internets? The internets. You know, <laughs> uh, this is before the web. You right. know, this is- uh, and Before I, the World Wide Web. Before the World Wide Web. Yeah. This is when the, the internets was like, you know, sitting down on a computer and typing in commands. Yeah. Uh, and I and I remember uh, this. This will sound really weird and sort of wonky, but I had ju- I'd been in South. I made a trip to South Africa in the early 1990s, which was to, to me just. I, I spent a couple of weeks there uh, for business when I was at VOA, and it was mm-hmm. an extraordinary experience. And I remember, I, you know, he's this guy comes in and says, "Hey, we can connect to all these different libraries around you know in places." And I said, "Okay, I want to connect to the library at the University of Cape Town," um, and like click click click. And suddenly I'm like looking at the, you know, the collection, cat- collection and, and the card catalog of, uh, I thought, okay, this is pretty cool. Remember when you thought that was cool? Yeah. <laughs> this is before the first picture, before the first, you know. Before the, the, well, no, the link was around back then. You still, you could link. Yeah. Yeah. But it was, uh, it was rudimentary. So yeah. we, so we funded these very early experiments into what, be, into basically non, you know, nonprofit, Public service versions of AOL and CompuServe, um, and then you know, obviously it all sort of it all That's amazing. came together. You're a person that, that that I've admired and respected for a long time, well, and and, um, and I and I love the way your brain moves when we get meetings. Just you know the way that you uh, can take something, analyze it, kind of speculate about the future a little bit, and I know that's kind of the mic behind the scenes and you don't really do that a lot but if you based off of what you've what you know and what you've experienced um can you give us any predictions for the future of education and, and your colleges like what are some of your, your predictions especially considering and i don't want you to consider this as the primary but consider this this pandemic yep. but what does the future of of higher education look like um and even, you know, if you have perspectives on the way hospitals are, are, are running uh, and the way they've run, do you have any thoughts on what that looks like in the future? What are some of the things that, that are coming down the pipeline? Because Duke is usually on the cutting edge of things. Where I know you? you've got secrets. You've got things that you've all been working on. What's what's the new cutting edge? Yeah, so so great question. And uh, by the way, that's not behind the scenes. I'm happy to you know, <laughs> opine about it. Uh, I just don't want to put you out there. No, just, you, you have know, to put I, your opinions and stuff no, out no, there. So, I, I, so I think there are, I think there are a couple of things. So let's let's talk about health first. And I, I'm, obviously, I'm not a doctor. I don't even play one on TV. Yeah. Right? But um, but we do have a very large health enterprise. I, I think one of the biggest um, uh, things that that we have seen was the immediate and um, ubiquitous move towards telehealth yeah you know so again we went from from being having a very very small you know almost microscopic telehealth cap- capability to very quickly hundreds of physicians thousands of visits every day right you know, so the ability to you know to to engage with you I mean I and I do this as well through my you know my my, my chart app and you know I mm-hmm. to engage with the healthcare um, system digitally is huge, yeah, uh, it, it's, and it has cost. It has implications for cost and uh, and and everything else. So I think that's you know, on the healthcare side. That's I mean there, there are lots of other things, but that's yep. clearly going. And there's there's a lot of policy stuff we can talk about, but that's clearly that's big though. Yeah, you know, that's 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 really, that's, that's really big. And yeah. it's not just you know it's not just diagnosing your you know your cold or your sprained finger, um, mental health. You know the explosion of 
uh, telehealth capability for mental health now mm -hmm. has been, uh, I, I think, is going to be revolutionary for addressing what really is a crisis in, in mental health yeah. um, uh, treatment for, for this country. So that's that's the health side. That's I think on the education side, on the higher education side, I can talk about it maybe with a little more nuance. I think you're going, you know, there will always be, and call me a fuddy-duddy traditionalist, there is always going to be higher education. No, I agree There with is you. always going to be a need for knowledge, for transmission of knowledge, for credentials, mm -hmm. for, um, and also for, like, social, you know, socialization. I mean, mm -hmm. the, you know, our higher education system is part, is part of the maturity of, of individuals. And, mm -hmm. and that's, and I think that, you know, the liberal arts education is that way. The residential university is that way. Um, I think there is also going to be a growing, unfortunately, a growing disparity between the haves, yeah. or the ha between the have, the have nots, the haves, yeah. the have mores, and the have a lot mores than everybody else. And, okay. you know, I'm, I say this from the perspective of Duke University. We're, you know, we're one of the top universities in the world in terms of resources. We have, you know, just resources that there are 5,000 colleges in America, 4,990 of them would like to be us. We, of course, would like to be you know, the 10 mm -hmm. that, that are there. But yeah, that, that is a, um, that's a very, it's an enviable position. It's a position of awesome responsibility mm -hmm. to society and to the and to the community. One, I think that we uphold, you know, in in a very important way, mm -hmm. uh, and and in a very uh, meaningful way. But I think the you know the danger point right now is, if is and there been, there are a couple of new books about this is if you look at how public university how how states at, are disinvesting. <clears throat> from public universities and you know classic you know, like like top of the list is mm -hmm. what we have seen with the University of North Carolina um, and the, no and I, I mean I, I, I will be the You're right yeah. I will be the biggest true and I, I hope I am the biggest cheerleader for for yeah. UNC I think I think the the single most important institution for the state for the future of the state of North Carolina is the University of North Carolina system that's why it's so important that we get certain things right. It is that there is nothing more, there's no institution more important for the future of this state have than, to agree than our higher, than our, and, and, and I think it's a testament to the strength of the, UN, the inherent strength of the UNC system. A lot of people have spent a lot of time over the last 10 years trying to break it and they can't. Yeah. So that is a, that is, you know, to me, that's, that's just how important and valuable and resilient it is. Um, and for Duke, the, the reason Duke is as good as it, as it is is because for 100 years, we've had eight miles down the road, a partner and a competitor, yes, yeah. but a partner. You know, there's nothing like, if you think about, about what's propelled this region, mm -hmm. what's, it, it, it's, it is the, you know, we're the only, uh, Tobias, you've heard me say this before, we're the only place in the country that has research as its first name. Yeah, I have heard you say that before. Everybody else would like to have that. Mm -hmm. We've got it. Mm -hmm. um, and it was some visionary work 50, 60, 70 years ago that, that brought that all together. And it's these, you know, these institutions and the companies you know, that have come from them and the mm -hmm. places that have been attracted here. That's, that's what makes this area special. If we didn't have that, we, we would not be who we are today. And, and we, mm -hmm. and we yeah, you know, so the future, you know, back to your question, what's the future of higher education? It's, it's creating those partnerships and those opportunities and the, the ability of those, you know, of people to come from all over the world to be a magnet here um, and to do research and create new knowledge and teach students and serve the community and play basketball and all of those things. You know, and the interesting thing about that is you all are in a, in a cool place because you're at an intersection socioeconomically, culturally. Um, you know, so many different ways that you all are able to teach a diverse set of students, you know, and I don't know if you still have the, uh, the Washington Duke Scholars Program yeah, yeah, still yeah, going yeah. on. So well, that... it's, it's changed. Uh, David Rubenstein and Dowd has announced the Rubenstein Scholars Program. Excuse me, David. Yeah. <laughs> Everything has your name. But, um, right. but thank you. Yeah. But, you know, even the mission of that, you know, what they were trying to do and the types yeah. of students uh, you all were trying to bring in with that. Um, 
So to hear you talk about even the margins uh, socioeconomically, I know that you, you know what you're talking about because you've all dealt with people well, on different levels. Well, think, think about this. You know, every major social change in our, in our memory and going back, you know, certainly going back in the last century, every yeah. major social change was incubated on a college campus. Yep. Snick. You know, race, the, you know, changes in attitudes yep. about race, changes in attitudes, um, you know, about um, uh, gender, mm -hmm. um, changes in attitudes about, you know, yeah. same-sex marriage. Yep. I mean, the, you know, every one of these trends, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse, but, mm -hmm. but every one of them is incubated and sort of begins on a, you know, somewhere, we, we've had to confront it mm -hmm. um, long before society. Yeah, long before, and and that you know that gives the time to kind of test it and to you know and to and to make it you know to make it better. All these things they wouldn't they wouldn't have happened if they if if it weren't for college campuses. So I lied. That wasn't my last question. I got another one because you just made all me. Right. So, do you think that is because you have all these different people in one place, just like you would for you know New York, Durham, yeah. San Francisco, a lot of these places you have higher population density. And so you see a lot of programs and different things coming out. You have that on a college campus, a university campus. Is that because you have all these different people in one place at the same time? It's a great question. I think that's part of it. Yeah. Uh, I think you have um, the ability to experiment. Uh, I think okay. you have, you know, you, there's, uh, you, there's the concept of academic freedom. You know, you have the ability to explore, um, to teach. You know, some of it is like, like truly age and brain development. You know, your brain at 18, maybe not your brain, you were fully formed. You, 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 you were born fully formed. Whatever, man. But, uh, <laughs> but your brain at 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, you know, you're absorbing things and you're doing things in a very different way than you're going to later on. I mean, I, right. like, like I said, the, a, a, the university has been around for a thousand years. Uh, it, if something like there, so I saw a study, uh, 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 something recently, of the um, 10 oldest ongoing enterprises, like you know, things that are, uh, you know, that, that, are, that are continuously operating yeah. uh, over the last you know, 2,000 years, I think something like seven of them are universities. So that includes like, okay, the Roman Catholic Church, been around for a long yeah. time. You know, there's some bank in Venice, I think, that's been around for you know, 1,500 years. And the rest are universities. universities. Oxford, Cambridge, Bologna. Wow, you're right. You know, you know what the oldest, um, you know what the oldest yeah, right. ongoing, the oldest continuously operating entity. I mean, Complex Creative will be this way, you know, in, in a couple of hundred years. Stop we'll it. Talking about it but I'm, I'm retiring at some point. The oldest, <laughs> the, the oldest ongoing entity yeah. in the United States of America, the oldest corporation, is Harvard University. 1630. Wow. It was incorporated in 1636, and it has been operating continuously since then. I didn't know that. Wow. So that's why we, we uh, when we talk about Duke being a young place, we're about to celebrate our centennial. Yeah. Um, we're 100 years old. In the higher education world, that's young. That's that's a kindergarten. Yeah. Central, my school, we we're older than young. Yeah. Yeah. So that's young. I mean, you you've got schools that are 200, 300 years old now. Um, but it's just amazing, and, and I think I agree with you. You know, when you have people that young in a in a, in a space like that, they're still trying to figure things out. They're still learning things, and they tend to move the culture. It's gonna, yeah, you know, in the same way that that Duke or Central, very different than what it was ten yeah. years ago, twenty years ago, fifty years ago, a hundred years ago. These places are going to be very different. They may be unrecognizable, yeah, but they will be here, yeah, and, they will, already and they will be doing important work, and they will be valuable, and. You know, my so my I, my I guess in my role, I, the you know, most important thing I get to do is to not like not screw it up, like all of us. Yeah. <laughs> Michael, thank you thank so you. much Tobias, for coming this through. Fun. This it was fun having you. It's always a pleasure to talk to you and sit and hang. Um, you know, thank you to the team that we have Indeed. around us, and thank you all for coming through. Um, and for everyone else, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for listening to us. I'm Tobias Rose. This is Conversations. And I'd like for you to subscribe. I'd like for you to like. I'd love for you to comment. And I'd love for you to follow us. Conversations. Um, and also, you can check us out on our website, 
Uh, for right now, go to the Complex Creative website. But uh, you can find out more about Mike at duke.edu. It's probably the best place for them to go. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Duke.edu if you want to know about Mike and his work. And probably CNN, ABC, all the big players because you're going to hear about them. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for coming back. Thank you for being here. We love you. We out. Peace.